A man disappears into thin air. A car may hold the answer to what happened. This was a puzzle from the start, and we were missing a few of the key pieces. But as police gather more clues, the case gets stranger and stranger. This case took us from a parking lot to a garage to a graveyard, and some aspects of the crime may always remain a mystery. Albany, Indiana, a small town just minutes from Louisville, Kentucky. Along Main Street, what you see is what you get. Or so it seems. Sunday afternoon, a woman reports that her husband has vanished. Melissa Humbert uh, contacted the police department to advise that her husband was missing. Eric Humbert is approximately 27 years old. They've been married for five years. They have a son that uh, Eric dearly loved. Melissa told investigators that uh, her and Eric had fights, um, that nothing unusual had taken place with Eric around that time period. Her husband was last seen with a friend, Jonathan Whiteside. Jonathan Whitesides and Eric Humbert were good friends and worked together at the U.S. Geological Survey. The investigators went and spoke with, uh, with Jonathan Whitesides since he was the last person that, that had seen Eric. Jonathan advised that he played basketball with Eric at, at work. Um, they left uh, work at about 5 o'clock and Eric was supposed to be going home. possible on his way home that Eric could have crashed or went down uh, one of the hills and uh, uh, wasn't seen, you know, had an accident and wasn't seen since. The investigation is handed to 28-year veteran Keith Whitlow. He knows that finding Eric may not be easy. The police searched the, uh, uh, some of the uh, avenues that uh, Eric might have taken. It's some pretty rough terrain in some of that area, some windy roads with uh, large gullies on either side of the road. We're here to search for a man by the name of Eric Humbert. He's in his mid-twenties, and he failed to return home yesterday afternoon from work. Police use a canine team to cover more territory. They search the river and the back roads, looking for any trace of a missing car. But it's no use. Eric Humbert has simply disappeared. Then, a lucky break. A routine police check across town changes the course of the investigation. Eric Humbert's car was eventually found, had been abandoned in Louisville, Kentucky, behind an apartment house. Uh, apparently, a uh, resident of this apartment house had noticed his car sitting there for some time. The car has been found, but not the owner. Has Eric Humbert just left town, or has something happened to him? Eric's car is towed to the police garage. Kyle Brewer hopes it holds the answer to Eric's disappearance. We again photographed it, opened the doors, photographed the inside. Then we looked the car over and we didn't see anything unusual. The car was in rough shape, so it's hard to see anything right off the bat. Until we got to the hatchback area. You can see what appeared to be blood and the blood back of the hatchback and the carpeting. Looks like it's pretty well soaked. An ALS, or alternate light source, helps Brewer to spot evidence like fingerprints and blood. There was so much blood in the hatchback area of the car that leads, led us to suspect to be other evidence inside the car. Hairs, fibers, more blood. 
so we did a more thorough exam. And Brewer's hunch is right. In search of the engine, one of the experts saw a small fragment on the fan of the engine behind the radiator. And he said, that's tissue. The tissue is tested, and the results are shocking. It's brain tissue. And then another discovery. While checking the engine, Brewer finds a key piece of the puzzle, a hole next to the windshield wiper. We could see where the bullet had ripped through the cowling and torn the metal. Blood stains, human tissue, and a 9 millimeter bullet hole. Police fear Eric is dead, but need proof. They search his house for a DNA sample, but nothing they find is usable. But Detective Whitlow has another approach that may yield positive results. To try to find out who that blood and tissue belonged to, there was a necessity to do a DNA comparison. Uh, this involved us uh, taking DNA samples from Eric Humbert's father. While not identical, a father and son's DNA are close enough to make a comparison. But there's a catch. Eric's father is dead. Detective Whitlow knows that the best chance of identifying the son is to exhume the father. We had the uh, casket brought to the surface and the evidence technician removed a section of Mr. Humbert's femur and this allowed us to obtain a DNA profile of Eric Humbert. DNA from the father's femur is consistent with the DNA from Eric's car. When all this uh, information was uh, correlated and, and compared, it was determined that the blood was in fact from Eric Humbert. Police can now prove Eric is dead, and they believe it's murder. Eric's disappearance is declared a homicide. Detective Whitlow knows that with minimal physical evidence, this case calls for a special kind of investigator. And he knows just who can help. Criminal profiler Dale Hinman. When we first heard about this case, we felt like we were trying to make a jigsaw puzzle with only a few of the pieces. We were sure there were other pieces out there. We just needed to know where to look. Agent Hinman's experience as a profiler allows her to analyze the psychology of a crime by examining where it took place. But in this case, that isn't possible. The only part of the crime scene we had was the victim's car. We were hoping that what was found inside the car may help us understand what happened to Eric. DNA evidence shows that Eric Humbert's blood is inside his own car. But police haven't found his body. Special Agent Dale Hinman joins the investigation. It was important to see where Eric's car was found because the location itself can tell us something, especially since it was miles from his home. Well, Dale, this is where we found uh, Eric Humbert's car. Was any evidence discovered here at the scene? No, there was no evidence found here actually uh, at the scene other than the car. Dale is curious about why the car was left in this particular location. Is it possible that it was here the entire time since the victim was missing? Uh, I would think that it probably was here, uh, put here immediately after the crime was committed. He probably thought he could put it here and it would take a while for it to be discovered. Well, perhaps the offender moved the car to this location to delay the discovery of the crime. Dale doubts that the actual crime was committed here. Well, because of the way this neighborhood is situated with the houses close to this parking area, if some violent act occurred here or an argument that somebody would have heard something right but no one did so it sounds like this crime must have occurred somewhere else and then the vehicle was transported to this location you have another crime scene somewhere yet to be located agent hinman and detective whitlow head to the police station to look at eric's car and talk to investigator brewer about his examination of the vehicle Kyle, this is Dale. 
How you doing? Good to meet Pleased you. Pleased to meet you. Well, we've, uh, Kyle and his team has went over this car pretty well, and they've discovered blood underneath the hood, and also a quantity of suspected blood in the hatchback area of the car. Was any other evidence discovered? Yeah, there's also blood spatter on the engine, and we found brain tissue. Dale knows that blood spatter could be a crucial piece of evidence. Well, based on the spatter pattern inside the vehicle, could you tell what position the victim was in when the shot was fired? Yeah, we theorized he was in the front of the car, facing the engine, either bent over or leaning over the engine. Was there any known mechanical problems with the vehicle? Uh, Dale, no. As far as we know, there was nothing uh, seriously wrong with the vehicle. As a matter of fact, it was his daily transportation back and forth to work. But just because the car was drivable doesn't mean it was in perfect shape. Dale thinks there's a reason that Eric was leaning over. The victim must have been bent over the engine, working on the engine, or doing something. And the trajectory of the bullet is going forward. He would have had his back to the offender. Well, in order for him to turn his back on the shooter and bend forward in the engine, he must have felt really comfortable with this individual in order to do that. But they're still missing a body, and they aren't sure where the shooting actually happened. To discover that, Dale and Detective Whitlow returned to the neighborhood where Eric's car was abandoned, presumably by the killer. With the car being discovered in uh, this part of Louisville, it's kind of a rough part of town, uh, our thoughts at that point in time that maybe someone had uh, brought harm to him. But why is Eric Humbert's car in this neighborhood? An informant's tip may hold the answer end up in interviewing some uh, confidential informants through the narcotics task force to see if anybody had any information concerning Eric Humbert. There was rumors that uh, Eric Humbert was a uh, substance abuser. And Eric's car was found next to a notorious crack house. Police make a plan to raid the house. Those inside are thought to be armed and dangerous. We're going to hit this crack house over here on Elm Street, shake it up a little bit, and see what we can come up with about Eric. Will a police raid provide the final piece of the puzzle and answer the question, what happened to Eric Humbert? Eric Humbert has been murdered, and police may have a lead in Louisville, Kentucky. The police heard that Eric Humbert may have been a drug user, and since his car was found near a crack house, they decided to raid the house to see if they could gain any new information. A block away from the crack house, police prepare for their next move. Officers separate into teams. Detective Whitlow gives the go signal. His team takes the front door. The other teams burst through the back. A half dozen addicts are rounded up. But they claim they've never heard of Eric Humbert. We found nothing that would indicate that he was involved with any big time drug traffickers that would wish to do him harm. We ruled out the drug connection. Detective Whitlow's only lead has collapsed. Whitlow calls Agent Hinman to go over the case one more time. Dale develops a profile based partly on elimination. If she can establish who wouldn't kill Eric, maybe she can establish who would. How was his home life? He had a young son that he cared a lot about, but there was some reported difficulties between he and his wife. If outlaws weren't involved in Eric's murder, maybe police should check his in-laws. Who would benefit from this crime? Is there anybody that was angry enough to want to kill him? Uh, he was well-liked by his friends and his co-workers, and we just couldn't establish why anybody would want to do anything to Eric Cumber. Uh, Eric didn't have a whole lot. He didn't have a, like, a, a nice car, so we could probably rule out carjacking. Uh, he tended to go home after work each day, so he really didn't hang out where he would place himself in a position to be robbed by someone. Dale focuses on the offender's motive. It may hold the answer to who killed Eric. 
If it's not a robbery and it's not a carjacking and it's not a narcotics execution, we should be looking for someone who's close to the home, someone who knew him well enough to lure him to this crime scene. We thought Eric knew his killer, which made this crime very personal. It was necessary to look at his family life, especially his relationship with his wife. But police don't have to look very far. Melissa's co-workers call the station. And what they say puts a spin on the investigation. Some of his wife's co-workers at a department store in Louisville started to call our office and told us that she was uh, possibly having an affair with a, another man. Detective Whitlow thinks that an affair might be the key to this investigation. To find out more, he interviews Melissa Humbert's colleagues about the man she was secretly seeing. This individual would show up at her place of employment, take her off to lunch, and sometimes picked her up after work at night and took her home. They furnished a, a physical description, that of uh, a, a white man with uh, red hair, having a beard, kind of heavy set. Detective Whitlow sends an officer to Melissa Humbert's residence to confront her. And when the door opens, it's not Melissa who's standing there. But it's someone police have seen before. Eric Humbert has been murdered, and police discover his wife Melissa was having an affair before he died. When police go to question her, they're shocked by who answers the door. It's not Melissa. It's the last man to see Eric alive. Jonathan Whitesides opened the door. That kind of threw up a red flag for investigators. Jonathan Whitesides matches the description of the man Melissa's co-workers reported seeing at their office. Whitesides was Eric's good friend, but he's also Melissa's lover. We never had a reason to believe Jonathan was involved, but when we learned about his affair with Melissa, we knew we had a new lead to investigate. Detective Whitlow requests a warrant to search Whiteside's house nearby, and it pays off. When the technicians first arrived at the scene, they did a quick cursory inspection uh, of the garage, and uh, they found some drumsticks, uh, like you used to play drums, that had uh, blood stains on them, and they also found a 9mm cartridge case in the garage. All of the evidence that was collected was taken to the lab for further analysis. If the bullet casings and drumsticks matched what was found in Eric's car, then they've got their man. And the lab results confirm what Dale and the police suspect. The 9mm bullet matches the bullet found in Eric's car. And the blood on the drumsticks belongs to Eric Humbert. Jonathan Whitesides is arrested for murder. After initially denying all involvement, Whitesides suddenly changes his story. According to Jonathan, once they arrived at his house, he had requested that Eric take a look underneath the hood of the car. Eric suddenly produced a knife. Uh, a scuffle broke out. And during that scuffle, Eric Humbert was uh, accidentally stabbed in the neck. Jonathan claimed that Eric was stabbed in the neck, but we knew this was not possible. The blood spatter pattern was consistent with a high velocity mist, which occurs in a gunshot wound. A stabbing would have produced a totally different pattern. We believe that Jonathan lured Eric to his house and came up with some reason for Eric to open the hood of his car. Once his back was turned, Jonathan Whitesides shot him. We think that Jonathan wanted Melissa all to himself. Police investigated Melissa Humbert's involvement in the murder, but she was cleared of any complicity. At trial, the jury deliberates for only 45 minutes before finding Jonathan Whitesides guilty of murder, even without a body. Whitesides is sentenced to 40 years in prison. We're still looking for Eric Humbert's remains, and I'll never forget what Eric's mother said to me uh, the day Jonathan was sentenced. She says, whatever you do, don't stop looking for Eric.
Without the skills of everyone involved in this investigation, Jonathan Whitesides may have gotten away with murder. He thought that by getting rid of the body, he could eliminate all the evidence. He was wrong.